So, happy Hanukkah, everybody. Welcome to Power Parsha. This week is Parshat Miketz. Today is the seventh day of Hanukkah. And so we'll do a little Miketz slash Hanukkah combo thought, even though when we read the Parshat Miketz on Shabbat, it'll already be after Hanukkah. Um, and so the Parsha opens... Uh, th- there's been in the last couple of weeks, within the last three weeks, we have dreams featuring very prominently in the Torah portion. A few weeks ago, we read about Jacob's dream. Last week, we read about Joseph's dream. And then we read about the baker and the and the butler, their dreams and interpretation of dreams. And this week picks up also on the theme of dreams with Pharaoh's dream. And um, dream is a topic that interests people. We did a whole class on dreams actually last year. And you can probably find it in our course archive on uh, ChabadMiami.com. In our course archive, you can take a look for a deep dive into dreams. Um, but uh, dreams, for some people, people pay no attention to dreams. Others take their dreams very seriously. So let's let's see what we can glean from dreams from this week's Torah portion. So uh, the Torah portion opens with Pharaoh having a dream. And he dreams that he's standing at the Nile River and he sees seven healthy, robust cows standing and grazing by the by the Nile, and then seven sickly cows next to them, and then the seven sickly cows swallow the robust, healthy cows, and it's if, as if nothing ever happened. The, those cows don't grow any bigger, they don't look any healthier, they're still these very small cows. And Pharaoh wakes up and goes back to sleep and has a second dream. And in the second dream, he sees seven stalks of grain that are, are healthy looking, stalks of grain growing again by the Nile River, and then sickly grain uh, that, that's growing and the sickly grain consume the healthy grain and he wakes up, he has a dream and now he is vatipa he's, uh, he's, he's disturbed. And so the commentaries wonder about this. It's so interesting that Pharaoh has this dream. He has a dream and he wakes up and goes back to sleep, has a second dream. And uh, if you look at the verses, in the first in the first instance, his first dream, he has a dream. It says, uh, Pharaoh wakes up. And the second time it says, the second time when he dreams about the stocks, he wakes up and it, behold, he had a dream. And, and then he's nervous and he's uncomfortable and he calls his uh, advisors, his interpreters, his dream interpreters to, to try and make sense of what's going on. And then, of course, the story unfolds. Joseph is elevated and comes and interprets the dream and so on as we know the story. But, but there's this contrast between the two. The first time he has a dream and uh, that's it. He wakes up and goes back to sleep, has a second dream. The second time, those when we're told, oh, he had a dream. And, and now he's agitated. What's the difference? So one, one perspective on it from one of the commentaries is that what happened was, you know, when we have dreams, generally the dreams are could be stuff you thought about during the day. They don't really have any meaning and content. Con- content. The dreams are just stuff. You, had a, you, you thought about something during the day. At night you went to sleep. Everything sort of uh, relaxes and your mind is is un, unchained and shackled to the 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 strict uh, the, the 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 context and the construct the the structures of, of of logic and so you can dream crazy things. So when Pharaoh has his first dream, he's he, he pictures that he's standing at the Nile River and he's seeing cows grazing. Now, true, seeing sickly cows swallow whole the other cows and have no impact. That's certainly something. Um, that's significant. I mean, that's that's pretty crazy stuff. That's not something he had had seen. But again, he's dreaming. When you dream, you could dream and imagine all kinds of fantastical things. Chances are, he thought to himself when he woke up, okay, he had a dream. Yeah, because it's it's a typical sight to stand at the Nile River and see cows grazing was not was not unheard of. It was a normal. It was a typical sight. So he probably when he was there in his on his morning visit to the Nile, probably saw some cows. And then it was you know when he goes to sleep and he's and he's. He's regressing into that uh, that that sort of uh, dreamlike state. Uh, he, he just imagined cows, some cows eating other cows. Big deal, nothing to see here. Those dream, that dream he felt had no content, not, didn't have anything to tell him. So whatever, he had a dream. He went back to sleep. But the second dream, he sees these stalks growing at the Nile. Now, stalks of grain don't grow near the Nile River, and so the whole thing was unusual. So Pharaoh wakes up, and now he has a dream, meaning a dream that something that has content, you know echoes of I have a dream, right? This idea that there's a dream that's telling him something. It's not just something he they dreamed about or thought about during the day or saw during the day and that now he's having this dream. This is something completely new. So it's not just, oh, my mind is running free in my dreamlike state uh, from some and, and, and just putting together random things that I saw during the day. This is not something he thought about before, which means he felt that this dream was telling him something. And obviously the similarity, the parallels between the two dreams meant 
that obviously there's something, and that's, of course, Joseph interprets this as well, the fact that he has this repeat dream, or two different forms of the same dream. But the point is, it was only the second dream where Pharaoh says, oh, this is a dream that has content, there's something here, I got to figure out what's going on. So the lesson for us from, from, from this is that, um, you know, dreaming is uh, something that uh, you, you can have a dream that's meaningless. And uh, we're told that our life in this world, especially in exile, particularly in exile, is like a dream, right? The uh, the psalmist says, uh, that in the time when, when the, the captives of Zion will be returned, in the time in the era of Mashiach, so it'll be it's like we were dreamers. What does it mean to dream? It says exile is like a, a dreamlike state. Living in this world, in a sense, could be like a dream. You can live in the world and dedicate yourself to all kinds of stuff and then find out, as Ecclesiastes tells us right in the opening, Hakol Hevel Havalim, it's all nothing. It's all empty. It's all meaningless. There's no purpose. There's no content. There's no substance. There's no significance to anything. We, we've talked about in the past um, something we say in Davening every day before the Shema, where we, we, we have a special prayer where we say that we, we ask God that we not be ashamed in the world to come. That when we when 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 people come up to heaven after living their full life, they come up to heaven and their life is played for them, and uh, it could be very embarrassing when you see that you've dedicated so much of your time and energy and 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 attention and 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 anxiety and whatever what, all of that to things that have absolutely no meaning that are meaningless, and so we pray that we should be involved in this world. We should engage in things that are meaningful, things that are substantive, things that are that are that 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 then produce a meaningful, a meaningful impact. And so that's what we, you know, we're sidetracked sometimes and we get involved and carried away with things that are meaningless. And so that's what we pray. We don't want to be ashamed by, by, by having shown to us all the meaningless things that we were so um, uh, consumed by and so distracted by and so preoccupied with and, and, and it, while neglecting things that are more meaningful. Okay, so that's, that's one lesson we can learn that uh, our life, there are these two types of dreams. There's a meaningless dream and then there is a meaningful dream, a, a dream that has content, a, a dream that has a message for us, right? And again, point is not so much about how we're going to interpret our own dreams. That's I, I'd refer you again to the class we did on dreams to, to discuss that. But just this idea, this perspective that in life, there are things that are meaningless and there are things that are meaningful. And uh, we certainly see in, 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 you know, so many things. Uh, in, in recent years that, that have pointed to uh, us to, to see the big institutions and the big ideas and, and, and processes and thoughts and ideas that we thought were so important and so meaningful, we saw all of it fall by the wayside. We saw all of it exposed for what it really is, which is meaningless. And we need to reevaluate and reassess and recalibrate and focus on the things that are really meaningful, the things that have meaning in them, which leads us to another question. Though. Okay, so there are meaningless things and then there are meaningful things, but another common perception today is that nothing really is meaningful, right? That 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 everything really is meaningless, that everything is really just a figment of your own imagine, imagination. You can find meaning in things, but the meaning is really arbitrary. The meaning, the meaning is really something that you just put to something, you ascribe meaning to something, and that's the meaning it has. But there's no inherent value, there's no inherent meaning to anything. Everything is just random. That's another. So is, is there, we can say, you know, based on the first thing we talked about, that there are things that are meaningless. We just sometimes get distracted and confused and we don't realize that they're meaningless. And so we have to go to things that are meaningful. But again, what does it mean to be meaningful? Is it something that's actually truly meaningful or is it something that I just described meaning to? Um, and so here we have a lesson from Hanukkah. It says, there's a, an interesting midrash that says that in the time of Hanukkah, so the, the Syrian Greeks who were oppressing the Jewish people uh, instructed the people, commanded, forced the people to write on the horn of a cow that they have no part in the God of Israel. Write on the, on the horn of a cow that you have no, or bull, that you have no, um, uh, of an ox, that you have no part in the God of Israel, which is a very strange thing. Why would you have to write that on the, on the horn of an ox? So here's a, an interesting insight. We know that uh, on Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. The shofar has to come ideally from a ram, but from other such animals. Um, that's a kosher shofar. The, the Talmud tells us, the sages tell us that, that the, the horn of a cow, of an ox, is not kosher. It's not a kosher shofar. So while ideally you want to use a ram, but you know horns of goats and horns of ibexes and other horns that are, that are kosher and can be used, but the horn of a cow is invalid. If you blow the horn of a cow on Rosh Hashanah, you haven't blown the shofar. It's not valid for the blowing of the shofar. And so here's something that's, that, here's the, the, the interesting thing. 
we know that the sound of the shofar is a call to action. Maimonides tells us famously in the laws of Truva, he says that when you blow the shofar, referencing a verse from the prophets, that when the shofar sounded, everybody's sh- shaken. The shofar is a call to action. The shofar is a call to stir us to, 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 to repent, to stir us to be better. It's, it's like I said, a call to action. When you blow the shofar, there's meaning. It's telling you, it's stirring your soul, it's reaching out to you to do, to act. When we blow the horn of a the, the, the horn of a cow, doesn't stir anything. That's not a shofar. That's not a call to action. That's that's a meaningless idea. What the Syrian Greeks were trying to tell the Jewish people is you want to ascribe meaning to your religion, to your practices, to your Jewishness, to your philosophy, to to your your, your religiosity, all that, all good. But just recognize that the the meaning is really arbitrary. Just ascribe whatever meaning you ascribe to it. It's not that there's inherent meaning. It's not that there's an ultimate truth. We today in our modern sensibilities are very uncomfortable with the concept of absolute truth. How could we know what absolute truth is? And the truth is to an extent, maybe we can't. But that that there is an absolute truth, that God is absolutely true, and that His Torah is absolutely true. That 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 is the truth, and so we need to be able to to connect with things that are absolutely true. And so when 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 the Syrian Greeks, when the oppressors tell the people, you know, you want to practice it, okay, take a shofar, but take a cow shofar, take a, a horn that doesn't that makes a noise that doesn't call to action, right? It's just whatever you decide to do, however it is that you're feeling. That's the connection you have to your Judaism. That's the connection you have to your God. That the Jewish people rejected, right? We blow the shofar, that's a call to action. And similarly, when we light the menorah, we do the same thing. We know that uh, when you go to sleep at night, most people like to uh, turn the lights off when you go to sleep. It's very hard to sleep with the lights on. Nighttime, when it gets dark, that's when we go to sleep. When are you more likely to uh, to dream? Like we said before, that during the time of exile, it's a time of dreaming. It's like we're dreaming because exile is a time of darkness, spiritual darkness. And so we're dreaming. You're in a dreamlike state. And so Hanukkah comes and we light the candles, we light the menorah to illuminate the darkness, to bring light to that darkness. That light is agitating. That light doesn't allow us to sleep. It's the light of Hanukkah, of the Hanukkah lights that call us to action, that spur us to action, that bring us to find truth and meaning and, and, and purpose even in that darkest time. So the lesson from this week's Torah portion from Hanukkah is that, yeah, there are things in life that are maybe meaningless, things that are fleeting, in the words again of Ecclesiastes, Hevel Havolim, it's 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 just nothing, and uh, we, we need to take a, make a commitment to dedicate ourselves, like the word Hanukkah, which is a rededication, a dedication, dedicate ourselves, commit ourselves to things that are meaningful, not just things that we ascribe meaning to, but to things that are absolutely meaningful, things that are inherently true and meaningful, and when we do that, we bring light into that darkness, we wake each other up, ourselves and, and, and our families and our communities, we wake them up from a slumber, and together we experience the ultimate lucid awakeness, which will be with the coming of Mashiach, may be speedily before the end of Hanukkah. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see you all next week.